Welcome to Quantum Photonics. I am thrilled to bring to your attention a truly remarkable and groundbreaking book that has recently come to my attention, uh, written by the distinguished Professor Ian Hill. Uh, and this work is not just an exploration of autism, but a profound and timely contribution to our understanding of neurodiversity as a whole. Professor Hale's uh, expertise as a medical scientist and his unique perspective as an individual on autism spectrum makes this book a valuable addition to the field. The narrative extends beyond a mere scientific discourse. It is a heartfelt journey into the intricacies of autism, genetics, allergies, and general health. Moreover, it delves into the nuances of having differently wired brains offering science-based advice that is both enlightening and sensitive. One of the most commendable aspects of this book is Professor Hale's candid and authentic approach. And as someone living with autism, he provides not only an informative overview of the current scientific research, but also a personal insider viewpoint. For instance, he challenges prevailing misconceptions emphasizing that autism is for life including senior care, and it is not a face. So uh, the breadth of topics covered is extensive, ranging from various conditions such as dyslexia, ADHD, Asperger's syndrome, to broader health issues like Crohn's disease. Professor Hale emphasizes the importance of recognizing individuals with autism first, acknowledging their unique attributes and understanding their quantifiably different ways of behaving. In a society where historical and current abuse against autistic individual persists, Professor Hale's book acts as a beacon of awareness. He fearlessly addresses the patchy, uninformed attempts at legislation and implementation, providing new factual insights. The book not only informs and empowers individuals, officials, parents, and carers, but also encourages those on the spectrum to speak out against discrimination and harassment. In my own research, I have found that the quality of opportunity defined as skilled support funded towards improvement for all significantly benefits society. And Professor Hill's book resonates with this sentiment, offering practical advice for autists, parents, carers, therapists, teachers, medics, and the public alike. So, uh, yeah, parents and carers uh, are really very much challenged when they try to raise their children on the spectrum. In the same way that I learned in my own research among the gifted community also, that it's really very challenging. It's like raising 10 to 20 kids all at once, having, yeah, uh, because the parents also are some sometimes not being trained or raised on how to recognize and care uh, because they belong to uh, the uh, other skew of the spectrum. So this book, I mean, for me, it's not just a book. It is an act of self-acceptance, reflecting Ian's authenticity, honesty, proud ownership, and empathy. It is my belief that this groundbreaking work will fill a crucial gap in the market, providing a valuable resource for anyone seeking a deeper understanding of autism and neurodiversity. So let's engage in a thoughtful discussion and reflection on this enlightening journey to autistic realities. So I would like to tell you more about our very uh, special eminent speaker, Professor Ian Hale. So yeah, for a while now, we've been friends in um, Facebook and we have also very strong communities, gifted communities, and uh, also um, um, highly gifted communities and uh, uh, polymathic communities. At the same time, uh, Professor Hale has been active in the transhumanist communities. So I would like to say something about him. Maybe, yeah, I could see that, you know, he discusses and is into a very very diverse topics uh, and also with an expertise. So uh, Professor Hale is a polymath, a consultant professor and a medical scientist with over 30 years of expertise in neurodiversity and higher education, senior TEFL instructor and award-winning author, a transhumanist, he's a professional speaker, problem solver, inventor and broadcaster, uh, Gen C TV, Global TV, and others with a proven track record of successful operations in the fields including intelligence, science, and corporate affairs. He designed he designs personalized fail-safe optioned systems for a broad variety of clients. 
he studied integrated medicine to um, international dipl diploma level, UNESCO, in 2002. He is a geneticist and a consultant epidemiologist with high-level skills in anti-aging and rigid nar narrative techniques. Um, evolutionary theory, game theory, pattern recognition, and data extraction. He is an acknowledged expert in neurodiversity, both in teaching and in terms of scientific background for design, research, management, and delivery. He solved problems in ways that others can't, being a clinician inventor who is uh, with a reference IQ of 193 in the Weichler um, test, in, uh, inventory test. And uh, yeah, he, his strategy, integrity, and absolute discretion, loyalty, and commitment to success are the personality traits from being an Aspie or someone who is having an Asperger syndrome, which is why he thinks out of the box. He thinks so differently and see the patterns and connections that others miss. So he is doing, as I said earlier, public speaking lectures, broadcasting, and advocacy. And he has been a guest professor of neurodiversity at the Turo Law School in New York in 2020. He, has, he had numerous invitations to broadcast and podcast, including Anna Kennedy's uh, OBE WRS in London in 2021, a keynote speaker. Uh, one of this was for the Charles Walter Society for Innovation and Research. And uh, he also did an expert interview with Professor Dr. Ratnesh Dwendi of Global TV in India uh, about the renewed threat of the mutated coronavirus in 2002. He was a keynote speaker at the World Autism Summit in September 2023, among others. So yeah, uh, actually, uh, Professor Hill told me his uh, bio is uh, very extensive. And yeah, I think uh, um, all the uh, introduction that I have alone is already a great uh, um, background that we have given to all of you. And uh, um, I would like to, maybe I'll just post his bio here at the room chat. And uh, yeah, I would just like to add that uh, being a polymath, uh, his interests include creative writing. He is an international award-winning poet, a creative, photo creative photography and videography and art dis and design. He is a digital creator with 3.1 million followers and is an award winner, an international master photographer rating. He is a musician, percussion, acoustic guitar, and vocalist uh, uh, performer. And he is also a collaborative songwriter. He is doing swimming and diving, charity team quizzes and events, cycling and walking clubs. Uh, so uh, before I say that I'm very proud to introduce him, I have a question to Dr. Hill. Do you even sleep? So. Uh, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> when well, well, I can. Um, first of all, uh, Mr. Moore, I would like to thank you and your staff very much for um inviting me and for arranging this i i've come to appreciate at least a, a, the tip of the iceberg of the amount of work that that you and uh, and your um you know associates uh, put into creating these events and um and i'd like to wish everyone listening to this a very good time of day so yeah um yeah, one of the big problems that people with neurodiversity experience is, is indeed sleep. You've, you've hit on a, a very important point there, and, and one that I've devoted virtually a, a whole chapter to in the book, um, because it is my view that um, <clears throat> sleep is the best doctor in the world, and um, it needs to be prioritized above pretty much anything else. So... Um, you know, with the sensory issues, for example, that people with neurodiversity has always experienced, um, you know, sleep is sleep is a big problem, and often um, people with neurodiversity have a very different sleep pattern compared to neurotypical people. And in the book, I've explored the reasons why, and they are very deep. And as Mr. Moore has said, um, evolutionary reasons. Um, the whole foundation of evolutionary theory, you know, well, fact in, in truth, um, is that 
diversity is what enables species to survive. And something that I've right at the beginning here would like to emphasize is that neurodiversity is absolutely crucial in the survival of our species. It's far from being something to be hidden away or ashamed of. It's something to be promoted and something to be appreciated and something to be um, encouraged and supported. Uh, that's one of the big uh, points of the book. And I've illustrated it with numerous examples, as well as the science explanation behind it. So to answer your question, uh, Mr. Mura, um, yeah, sleep's an issue. Yeah, welcome to the club. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, in our conversations, I realized that, you know, uh, in our private conversations, I realized that we have so much in common, although we've known each other for some time and we have common groups and interests. So, um, yeah, uh, it's uh, just great to validate uh, issues and problems that uh, maybe uh, people, uh, the people who have the same maybe diversity as us have uh, uh, been existing as well as you know things that we enjoy so uh yeah um we will open the room for uh, please prepare your questions if you had read the um the great review uh on the top from amazon by uh dr jennifer hawkins the an author a phd and author of feelings and emotion based learning a new theory in 2017 published by palgrave macmillan and brain plasticity and learning implications for educational practice by Paul Gray, Paul Macmillan. So yeah, you you can uh, ask questions a little later. So probably what I would like to ask uh, Dr. Hale for now is that uh, to give us a background about the book because I know we have a um, really niche audience here because I'm sure people already have a lot of questions about autism on uh, their head and uh, I think Think they would like to know uh, in general what the book is all about so uh, may you tell us a little more about about it in general uh, and where is it available is it uh, available in hardbound softbound and also as an ebook so uh, please tell us about it uh, thank you yes um, the book is available um, from Amazon and other uh, you know uh, sources of that nature. It was. Um, it's available as a hardback. It's available as a paperback, and it's available as an in, uh, an ebook, and also Kindle. And uh, I believe on other. It's available on about fifty different platforms. So it's it's fairly easy to find. It's not a hugely long book, um, because I've. You know, I'd read so many textbooks, um, you know, that are absolutely impenetrable to the majority of people. Um, there are a lot of books that are anecdotal, written by parents about their own experiences. Um, you know, and there are the, the diagnostic manuals. And it occurred to me from my own experience that, yeah, that's fine. But, you know, there's no book written that actually explains in terms that, you know, the, the average person who's not a psychologist or, or a doctor or a medical scientist or whatever could actually understand. Um, one of the things it does is to actually explain the jargon and the meaning and the impact on an individual and on a family's life um of what these these terms mean when psychologists and that throw them around so part of it was part of the intention was to democratize to and to demythologize um neurodiversity and and, and particularly autism of course um and another part was to was to um remove the prejudices against it, explain where they came from, 
and explain why they're wrong. Um, and something else that I that I really wanted to emphasize, given this wonderful opportunity, is that neurodiversity is not new. As far back as we can tell from uh, forensic science, that is to say, analyzing the genomes of people from long ago and knowing the genetic sequences, or at least knowing some of the genetic sequences, which you always find in each part of the uh, neurodiversity uh, community, whether that person be autistic or ADHD, as Mr. Mora says, or whether they be schizophrenic or whatever. Um, you know, we do know now which which uh, sequences indicate what they were. So it's been possible to go back to um, to extract DNA from Neanderthals, you know, maybe 50,000 years ago. And this teaches us that neurodiversity is as old as, as the, you know, as humanity and before is. And the same applies, and again, something to emphasize, is that that applies to animals as well. Human beings are not unique in, in um, possessing neurodiversities. And it, it was all of these, these unanswered and unknown and unasked, indeed, questions uh, that I wanted to put into the book. As, as Mr. Morris says, you know, I, I think differently because my brain is different from normal. Um, I perceive the world differently. Um, I perceive color, for example, differently from what I hear from other people. Um, so, yeah, and, and patterns. When you do enough research, you know, and I, I researched this book for over a decade. Uh, you know, there were certain things from a, a broader range of reading as possible. I think there are about 160 different sources listed in the in the bibliography at the end, something like that. Um, you know, patterns began to emerge. And a lot of it was, was people talking about their experience of neurodiversity. You know, and being in that community, you know, I got to hear more. Um, you know, than, than, than most people would do. And uh, it became very apparent that there are things in common, as Mr. Mora said, for example, the, you know, the whole issue of sleep, for, you know. Uh, another big point that I wanted to make um, is that a gifted child or a gifted adult is every bit as much a special needs human being, person, um, as people who are are not gifted. A, a gifted child needs special education in the same way as a child on the autism spectrum needs special education. Um, and we're talking about support. And the same applies to the families of these children. You know, they need special support as well. And that is why one of the emphases that is in the book is that uh, the earlier the diagnosis can be made, the better and the quicker support and, uh, and intervention can come. And it's been proven over and over again that the earlier the intervention, the more positive and the more wide ranging results um, will be achieved, providing, of course, that the diagnosis is accurate in the first place. Um, would anyone like to say anything at this stage or, or shall I talk a bit more about the book? Yeah, I would just like to comment that uh, I certainly agree with the points that you made because most of the 
supposedly experts who are trying to make these books or guides for gifted people, for neurodiverse people, and also for uh, uh, people who are in the autism spectrum are provided in the field of, you know, what they are observing. But is there, uh, I really appreciate you're uh, writing this book because also coming from the gifted community and studying uh, gifted children myself and uh, trying to relate to our community, it's uh, uh, very painful not to be understood. And secondly, my opinion is that, and uh, people who are also gifted agree that uh, uh, the experts will not certainly understand them uh, if these experts were not really gifted themselves because, uh, yeah, they see, anyway, they see the world with different eyes. So I, I really like that you brought up that uh, particular topic and uh, yeah, being at the opposite end of the spectrum is indeed uh, very difficult. And also I agree with your saying that the uh, early diagnosis is very important or early identification because the um, autism and other neurodiversities uh, comes with Comorbid, comorbidities uh, many times that it sometimes there is a misdiagnosis or a dual diagnosis but it's hard to justify it. or for instance uh, uh, it's very hard to tell apart uh, by an expert uh, uh, until he makes a longitudinal observation about uh, you know uh, someone having child a childhood schizophrenia or being in the spectrum of autism or Asperger's because basically uh, they are not also there in themselves and of of course, there are expert studies, for instance, about apophenia, apophenia meaning seeing patterns when in fact there is nothing. But who makes the opinion about patterns that is nothing at all? These are also people uh, who are just trying to bank on other people's studies. But uh, in the end, my observation is that those people who are uh, able to see emerging patterns are people who actually are, you know, neurodiverse. And so therefore, they are the ones making innovations and uh, solutions to problems which uh, most of us cannot uh, solve. So I would just like to echo your uh, comment and also yeah, uh, what you wanted to say in the book. I think I agree on so many points, including sleep, and there are a lot of examples. And I would like to also add that um, I remember, uh, you know, Einstein and Goodell, Gerdel, Kurt Gerdel, and how uh, Gerdel is also very, very uh, gifted. And in the end, uh, you know how he passed away. So he did not want to eat anymore because he was having some suspicions that he was being poisoned. But on the other hand, whoever understood, you know, what he was thinking. And so it would have been really nice to go deeper into understanding uh, many factors in each person, just like what you, you saw, said in the book, that it would be different for each person. Uh, even for the autism spectrum alone, it has a very wide spectrum uh, from those who are not functioning up to those who are uh, having this Asperger's plus other factors, twins uh, that are there. So yeah, I, I would just like to comment before people ask questions because these are my personal experiences, having uh, also being a professional about gifted education and being a, pro a professional speaker for yeah uh, all our experiences on the trains with the other experts as well so but i could say that you know for long times that we have spoken on that and discuss discussing on the field uh, it was very hard to really come to a, a, a conclusion which is acceptable and so i think the uh, study continues and evolves and uh, I really appreciate you know your uh, sharing with us because you are in the field yourself later on I would like to ask you a question maybe this is personal but I think it will help in your trying to present to us what you have uh, in the book as well this is a personal question Dr. Hale uh, I want to ask you uh, when did uh, when were you ever diagnosed or if your parents realized that you are in the neurodiverse uh, uh, field? I, I'm very curious uh, to ask that. Uh, that's, that's absolutely fine. And anyone is, is, is free to ask any question that they want to. Um, you know, the, the, the book is pretty candid. Um, it's not that autobiog uh, autobiographical but there are areas where it is and, and when it is I've made that very clear um, I guess up to a point my my mother was a 
very, very senior Royal Navy nursing officer. Um, and she told me when I was older that she noticed that I was different from other children um, a little before my second birthday. Um, I was sent to nursery school, kindergarten, I think, in America it would be called, and in Germany, I think. Um, and that was a, an horrific experience of abuse, uh, which my parents realized fairly quickly. Um, elementary school was a waste of time for me. All my education came from, from home. I can't think of a single useful thing I ever learned at between the ages of five and 11. Um, absolutely nothing. Um, but fortunately, my, my parents were very, very educated, remarkable people. My grandfather was an extraordinary man, um, a, a complete polymath. Um, you know, he'd, he'd built a television set, for example, in the, in the 1950s uh, that was giving 1221 resolution. And when you consider that 1080 is considered HD now, high definition, um, that gives you an idea. And he had about 50 or 60 different jobs. I've probably done 40 different ones. So I, I guess at some level, whether how consciously or unconsciously, um, you know, my mum in a way was, was kind of prepared because obviously she knew my father's family and as far back as I've been able to research, and that's discussed in the book, um, you know, it's been full of neurodiverse people, which really made it very clear to me that, you know, the, this, these are genetics and they're passed down from generation to generation um, and had been for a while, for at least 250 years. And I have researched a little further back since, um, you know, that preparation and it, it goes back. Well, as far as I can find. Um, so, um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's that was something. I achieved nothing at, at, at primary school, as I said, and that they were very concerned. Um, and one of the things, actually, that my parents never noticed was that I was that one of the problems I had at, at school was that I couldn't see the blackboard because I needed glasses. Uh, which I got when I was seven. Um, that changed things better in some ways. Um, I think from the teacher's perspective, a lot worse in other ways, because once I could actually read what was going on, um, you know, I was full of questions. You know, I think one of the um, hallmarks of intelligent people is that they're that they're full of questions and curiosities. You know, and you know, wanting to find out. I think that's one of the most defining factors of intelligence. And um, I think I was about seven or eight when my parents took me down to a, um, a Navy psychologist that my aunt knew in Plymouth. And um, he diagnosed me then as PDD-NOS, um, a pervasive developmental disorder of no origin specific because people really didn't know anything about autism or Asperger's or well very much else then but I mean he made it clear that you know yes he's different and um, he also told my parents and they told me when I was old enough to understand that that meant that I was going to be a late bloomer and not to worry about not achieving anything at school because the intellect would would kick in later. Um, that it was a a delay, not a um, not a cul-de-sac. And I was about twelve or thirteen when I suddenly went from bottom of the class to top of the class. Um, apparently. And I, I only learned this uh, in 2002. Um, everybody who knew me well uh, had always just made the assumption that, yeah, he's on the autism spectrum. Um, and in the end, one of my colleagues at work said, I really think you ought to get a formal diagnosis because, you know, we've known you for years and 
you know, we all think that you have that you have autism of some type. So I, I made an appointment and went to see Professor William Fraser at the University of Cardiff, who is who was very, very highly rated uh, worldwide, not just in the UK. And it was he that, that diagnosed me in I think it was either June or July of 2002. I'd have to I'd have to check files to, to answer that question. And um, he was also one of the only two um, psychologists in the United Kingdom to be certified as a, a Mensa psychologist. Um, and I mean, after he diagnosed me with Asperger's, I saw him a second time and um, and he did a, a an intelligence test and invited me to join Mensa, which I did. So um, I hope that's that's answered the question fairly fully. But I mean, from a really early age, from the time I started to go to school and, and mix with other children, you know, I, I definitely realized that, uh, to quote Robert Heinlein, that um, I was a stranger in a strange land. And I think one of the things that is absolutely true of everyone I've met on the spectrum um, and that never gets discussed is that it is a very isolating experience. You are outside of mainstream society. And that in itself is very stressful. You know, medical science has shown that, you know, loneliness is very, very bad for your health, um, physically and mentally. And, you know, that's a challenge that's very much been ignored by, uh, you know, support, what support there is, which is, you know, really little. And, you know, my parents got no support to help with me at all, except that they were so supportive and my grandfather was so supportive and they, and they kept feeding my mind with, you know, brilliant books and puzzles and, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, both both of them were, you know, very uh, learned people. My, my father wrote, spoke and read Latin fluently. Um, you know, so and also I think one of the probably my saving grace at school was that I was a very good sportsman. I, I was in the. Uh, the first 15 rugby squad and I was um, first, I was the opening bat for the, the first 11 uh, cricket, um, which considering that the school I went to uh, is, is, an, is an academy school for sports and science, um, you know, sport is taken very seriously, was then, still is, in the same way as science is. Because the first school I was sent to after um, elementary school, um, that that was another wasted year. And my father decided to, he had to actually sell the, the house and move to a different part of, of uh, Bristol in England, where we come from, uh, in order to get me into a, a school that he considered would be a nurturing environment. And that's where I went at the age of 12 to the Sports and Science Academy School. And yes, it did prove to be, you know, the kind of a launch pad for, you know, for my development. So that's the story. That's how it went. And that was that was a great experience at school. It's called Wellsway Academy of Sport and Science in Keynesham, which is one of the outlying towns of Bristol. And uh, shout out to them. They were great. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Ian. Ian, so um, I would just like to welcome Kevin and Sterling on stage because, uh, yeah, Kevin also knew Dr. Hill uh, in another social media and he suggested Dr. Hill, although I invited Dr. Hill earlier, but uh, we weren't able to make a schedule. So I really appreciate that, Kevin. And I also would like to welcome Sterling because I appreciate the support of Sterling to this uh, quantum photonics clubs in many of our rooms. So yeah, welcome to the stage and to everyone, even if we have not finished uh, the presentation of Dr. Hill, uh, type your questions here on the room chat or uh, Dr. Hill himself said that maybe if you have questions, you can ask uh, at this point. Is that right, Ian? 
Yes, so all right. Uh, so uh, maybe you should continue a little bit more uh, telling us, uh, you know, not all of the book, but the uh, other uh, uh, highlights of the book that you would like to share with us. Uh, there's a microphone at the bottom to the right. Yes, yeah. one of the things I, that the book emphasizes very strongly, and as far as I know, I, I was the person who, well, one of the first people certainly to to um, to use this phrase, and certainly the first one to um, expand on the subject, is that being neurodiverse is an all body experience, a whole body experience, because it's genetic. Yes, it affects the neurological structures, both chemical and physical of the brain. But of course, being, you know, part of the genome, it affects everything else. Mr. Mora earlier on uh, mentioned the comorbidities where you find neurodiversity to give just one of many examples, you will always find some kind of gut problem. And of course, now we're beginning to learn the connection between the the main brains in the within the skull and the and the third brain, which is located on the left side of the stomach and all the way through actually the the lower intestine, um, the enteric nervous system. Um, we are beginning to understand the that that you know basically we have three brains, and that what affects one affects everything else. Um, and again, we're beginning to understand that the the gut flora, particularly um, in people with neurodiversity, is quite different um, compared with people who are neurotypical. And I'm pretty sure that analyzing gut flora will become one of the foundations for um, future diagnosis. So, you know, that that as again, Mr. Mora mentioned earlier on, um, that is what gives rise to allergies, to food intolerance and all the rest of it. And that is why we're so often children and who are neurodiverse are described as picky eaters and, you know, eat it or starve or, you know, whatever. No, because their gut feeling um, is telling them that you know, through their sense of smell, that this is something that's going to cause you a problem. So no, they're not picky eaters, far from it. They're being very discriminating because instinctively they know um, what they can and cannot eat safely. Um, so that's, a, that, that's I said that this book's a big myth buster. And, and that's one of the things I wanted to do. Um, so, you know, this, this is, it's, it's not just about, you know, the social impact, but I also wanted to offer a, you know, a lot of advice, practical advice to, to parents and also scathing criticism. I mean, I haven't pulled any punches in the book and I, there's no question it's controversial. It's intended to be, to stimulate debate that, um, you know, the parent's greatest fear from the moment their child or children are diagnosed with a neurodiverse condition is what's going to happen to my child when I am no longer able to advocate or look after them? Because, they, you know, for a long time, and it's still believed widely, that autism, that neurodiversity is a childhood phase and that magically when you reach the age of 18, it goes away and any support that you were getting up to that age, that disappears from, I mean, from 18 onwards, you, you're on your own. All you've got is your family and your friends, you know, who may be supportive, who may not be, who may know a lot, who may, who know, may know, they know, they may know very little. And, um, you know, part of the, the, the reason for the book is to try to bridge that gap and, and also to tell the authorities exactly what they should be doing 
and where they've got it so wrong. And there are there are plenty of examples in the in the book to uh, to illustrate the, those points. So yeah, you know, it is a it is a controversial book, and I'm sure a lot of doctors and psychologists, particularly, uh, will read it and be uh, I don't know offended probably. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, that's okay because you know. I've written it to help the majority, not the not the minority of 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 professionals who, frankly, I think, I found, um, fall very short of uh, acceptable standards. So it's a wake up call to them as well. Far too many um, medical professionals teaching professionals and in other professions seem to think that their field reached its zenith of knowledge at the very point they received their scroll and they never do another day's research afterwards to keep up to date. Um, that is, in my view, unforgivable and it's a point made very strongly. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hale. So, uh, yeah, in case uh, Kevin or Sterling, you would like to speak, maybe you can uh, speak or ask questions. And I see there are many that there are many comments on the room chat. I think there are questions for uh, Dr. Hale, which Bob probably can read if you can, Bob. Oh, Sterling is yeah, I, Mike. I can see the questions as well. And good morning, Sterling. Um, good morning. Christy. Kevin, thank you very much. And actually, I agree with you, Cecile, of course. Uh, uh, Joe Bernard. Hi, Joe. Um, do most neurodivergent individuals such as Asperger's find they need less sleep when stimulated? Uh, I think the answer is yes. But of course, um, that creates a sleep debt. Um, and catching up sleep, although is is a much better than not catching up sleep, uh, it's still much better if you can to to make sure that you get plenty of sleep all the time rather than just in fits and starts. But yes, I mean, particularly someone with Asperger's or schizophrenia, when they when they get into the into the zone, yeah, that's absolutely right. They they. They don't notice that they, it's not that they don't need the sleep, it's that they don't notice that they need the sleep. And the same applies to, to eating and drinking. Um, you know, when you're really in the zone, and I noticed this a few times um, writing the book, uh, the rest of the world goes away, and, and that includes your own feel, feelings sometimes. Um, yeah, and uh, Birdie Origin, uh, yeah, very difficult to wind down and prepare for sleep. Very difficult. And no, it, it actually, I've found people with neurodiversity uh, need more sleep. My, my recommendation would be, um, well, is uh, 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 10 hours. Um, it, it's interesting that a lot of the, the famous neurodiverse people, um, you know, sleep. Uh, you know, anything up to 14 or 15 hours a day. As they say, it's not the uh, the hours that you put into the work, it's the work that you put into the hours. Um, working long hours doesn't mean you work better, it just means you work long hours. Uh, Sterling, the, the connection between autism and the vagus nerve, uh, yeah. It, it exists. I, I wish there was time to go into it more, but, um, you know, that's something that is discussed in the book. Ash Bell, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, we, we have our instincts when it comes to food and, and drink. And, you know, the other the other sensory issues as well, because many people with neurodiversities are, are very light sensitive. I am, for example, but an awful lot of people are. Um, Mary Moon, thank you. 
Christy, love, thank you. Um, ah, Sterling Cooley. Oh, sir, you asked some difficult questions. Um, how easy is it for for you to pick up on others being neurodivergent? Um, can you hear it in how someone with autism talks? Um, no, not necessarily by how they talk, but yes, um, there seems to be some kind of a a signal that. You know, it's like we broadcast on a on a different wavelength from neurotypical people. And if you if you are ND, uh, yeah, we we pick it up. Michelle, that's that's an experience that that many many people share. That through through your children, you begin to understand yourself. And uh, well, I think also understand your parents and your grandparents better. And yeah, the the more you know, the more you know. And and yes, it, there's this sort of feedback loop between generations. So yeah, I completely agree with you. I um, Christy Love, um, absolutely yes, it is worth getting a an official diagnosis. Um, because that's the only way you'll you'll possibly get support. Um, ADHD doesn't is not considered part of the the autism spectrum, but uh, often being, if you've got one neurodiverse condition, the odds are that there's there's going to be more than one. So yeah, I, I definitely um, recommend finding a a psychologist or a psychiatrist that other people who are neurodiverse recommend and um, and getting a formal diagnosis. Uh, I and think yes, yes, totally. again, Michelle. Yes, Joe. Um, <laughs> yes, Christy, point, uh, Christy, love point taken. Um, Omar, uh, yes, uh, I'm I'm aware of the the one minute and the five minute army techniques to sleep in five minutes. Um, tried them, given given them to other people who are neurodiverse, doesn't work for them in the majority of cases. Um, yeah, overstimulation that's a huge problem. Uh, thank you, uh, Anna. Wow. Um, yeah, Michelle, destructive patterns are there because of the frustration of not being understood, I think, so often. So, um, yeah, melatonin, uh, tried it, doesn't work for me. Doesn't work for anyone with, with any neurodiversity, I know. But it does work very well for people with who are neurotypical. Um, thanks, Ash. Yeah, so I uh, think British. I think Sterling Sorry, wants to. Uh, Sterling uh, wants to one more ask if I may. a question on stage with his voice. Oh, great! Yes, let's let's do that. Yeah. Uh, hey, Anne, can you hear me? Ah, very well, thanks, Sterling. How are you? Doing great. Uh, thanks, Cecile, for the great group as well, as always. Um, so, uh, very interesting talk today. I My question is about um, kind of like, it's a maybe a two-part question. Feel free to answer as much or as little as you want. Uh, my question, sure. yeah, it's about kind of this link that I'm wondering if you've read more about it about the link between um, autism and when parents do too much ultrasound on their child. Um, like I, I think in the US there are some limitations on overexposure to a developing brain uh, in the womb uh, when the baby's at like, you know, uh, I think four, four to nine to nine months. Um, do you think have you explored any of these uh, connections in people that you've talked to 
where they're like, oh, my parents just like sat there with an ultrasound probe and imaged me for three, for, for, for an hour. Um, I, I know a case of, even a famous case of Tom Cruise, the, the famous actor and his wife, they, mm. heard, they did that for sometimes two hours a day uh, and their child came out with autism. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious. And then I have, I can ask a follow-up question after that, but yeah, uh, what, any connection there, do you think? Um, none that I've been, I, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of it. I've, I've read a couple of uh, journal papers on it. Um, but no, it's it's pretty much impossible to see how it would make a difference. Um, what 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 there are, I don't know about other countries, but in the UK, the doctors are rightly very very loath to use um, CAT scans. In other words, any kind of uh, nuclear detection uh, on on um, you know at pre birth because radiation definitely can affect, well, does affect the genome and can produce these effects. But there's, I haven't found yet any solid evidence that, that ultra scanning or MRI scanning can, can do that. Um, hmm. the, the evidence that I've seen has all been um, circumstantial and or anecdotal. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. So. My follow-up question is is to ask you if you have ever tried any type of neurostimulation technology. Um, I asked that question a little bit earlier in the chat about the vagus nerve yeah. and autism, and I've definitely seen there's there's definitely from my observations. I I do professional work in the vagus nerve and uh, mm -hmm, stimulating mm -hmm. it, so I work in like biotechnology bioelectronics, that kind of stuff. And yeah, cool. you typically see some of the treatments that are used in autism do involve, uh, it's like a small ear, it's small ear clips or a small uh, electrode that you tape onto the, to the ear that administers an electrical, a very tiny electrical current over the auricular branch of the vagus nerve that goes through the left ear and the right ear. And that helps with um, autism symptoms, especially at a younger age. Um, and so parents really do like that uh, for their kids. Um, have you have you ever experimented with any kind of brain stimulation technology or vagus nerve stimulation technology in, in your own life? Is, have you encountered uh any of that stuff? I've, I've encountered it, yes, and, and everything you say about the the stimulation of the vagus nerve, um, I, I agree with a hundred percent. And and you know the scientific evidence is is there for anyone, you know, to to check that if they have any concerns. And uh, you know it's it's a you know it is a it's a very important thing. I mean we we don't fully understand the vagus nerve yet, but the fact that the you know what you say, what you're doing, yes, it's definitely good. And what's more, I, I know of a number of neurotypical people who have also found that their IQ score uh, improves with the use of that technology. Um, so it's, you know, this is something for the for the world in general. Um, you know, it, it seems a, a common factor, regardless of what, you know, what kind of brain you have. Um, I mean, one of my interests is the is is the thymus gland. Uh, as well, and just an aside, um, have I? I've I've not done the vagus nerve. Um, I've not tried that technology. I've never had the opportunity. Um, I do. Uh, I I do use um, particular types of music uh, for the the P centers to to help, um, and that's explained in the book. Uh, and um, and there, there are other. Uh, I think, yeah, for me, I think music's probably very a very important thing. Um, and uh, you know, as Mr. Mora pointed out, oh, you know, you know, I, I'm I'm a musician. I'm oh, by the way, I, please don't over 
underestimate my abilities on the guitar. I'm, I'm much more of a percussionist than a, than a vocalist. But I, I find that, that that helps greatly. Um, there are, and the, the Vegas nerve, yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to give it a go. I have used uh, VR goggle uh, uh, stimulations um, and, you know, programs specifically designed for people who are neurodiverse, which, you know, I found absolutely mind blowing and, uh, and definitely very, very interesting indeed. And, and certainly very stimulating. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure more and more of these techniques will be developed as we as we learn more. So, yeah, thanks. I hope that answers your, your question. OK. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I wanted to just uh, put it out there while I'm while I've got the stage is uh, some of the work that I do. It, it, we're doing a kind of a public, um, how do I say this, uh, kind of a, a, a private study, uh, but open to the public to submit applications to do neurostimulation um, of the vagus nerve. And it's a, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put my link to the study in the chat in the comments here on Clubhouse. Um, so for Hi. you and, and anybody else who's interested, since this is such a small group, that's totally cool. Um, we're going to be doing uh, ultrasound stimulation, uh, adult stimulation of uh, the vagus nerve. Uh, and uh, uh, so everybody, everybody who wants access uh, can, can get access to the technology. Uh, it's basically at cost. Um, there's two options that like, one hundred and fifty dollars and fifty dollars uh, for people to participate as long as you submit your uh, voice recording after every session for two weeks. So um, we're going to do a voice analysis after simulation. So anyway, um, yeah, if that's something you want to join in, I, I I can definitely keep keep your keep your name on on the list. Uh, right, that'd be great. If you're yeah. on if you're on Facebook or Instagram or anything. Um, you know, please hit me up and connect LinkedIn, wherever you like. Okay. And, you know, that that's an invitation to everyone in the group as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Ian. Because I, you know, I regard being a part of this as a, you know, as a, you know, very much as a privilege and, a, and an honor. So thank you. Yeah, Sterling, you can link uh, <clears throat> what you had mentioned at the room chat. Uh, this is a good reference for people in the audience. So you're very much welcome to put your link. And yeah, I would like to ask Bob because uh, I think there was a question by British Sugar Cane, which uh, mm. important for him, which was not uh, read earlier. And yeah, we'd like to um, read it so that those who are like driving or are not looking at their phones right now, but are just listening to us like we're on the radio, will be able to uh, hear what the question and after that, uh, Dr. Hill can answer that question. Bob, are you, are you okay, okay to read? To read? Uh, yes, indeed. <clears throat> um, he asks, hello, I'm high function and I want to become a recruiter. I'm hesitant about getting burnout meltdown after three months. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'd, I'd like, like to know, to know if it's possible what kind of recruiter he's. I mean, recruiter covers such a wide, um, you know, such a, a you know a, a wide area of, you know, um, professional practice. Um, w without knowing more detail, I, I don't want to answer that question. Yeah, uh, we'd like to invite British uh, Sugar Cane to come on stage so that you can interact and explain. Uh, yeah, what uh, explain further uh, and also specify. So uh, please come up the stage or write what kind of recruiter are you? And at this point, I'd like to welcome Abyss, who is uh, uh, one of our regular moderators here in quantum photonics. Uh, he's on stage and yeah, hi Abyss, welcome. And 
Uh, would you like to ask a question? We are here discussing the book as on the top of the screen. Uh, Dr. Hale has written other books, but this one is the latest one. Uh, please, uh, if uh, everybody you have came in late, uh, please check out that book and it's available on Amazon. So Abyss may want to speak or ask a question as he's, uh, I see his hand here. Abyss, welcome and yeah, please feel free to speak. Oh, thanks, Cecil. Um, hey, Bob. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all. And hi, hi and thank you for your presentation. I haven't been here for a while, so I don't have any questions at this moment, but I'll be listening though. Thank you. Great. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to say something about this, if I can. Please. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to just say good morning, Dr. Hale. And and uh, I'd like to say that, yes, I, I identify with you and, and I feel a great kinship with you. And um, perhaps my input and something to throw in the pot and see what you think about it is I think conditions like this are rare and uh, I think they blur the lines. You, you know, they say like Elon Musk, you, you know, when he hosted SNL, you know, said that he had Aspies, you know, when, when at that time, you know, they already changed their mind saying that Asperger's is on the autism spectrum, you know. And so things are, you know, I think things are changing all the time. As, and as we learn, and I've learned a lot from you already just from the genetic aspect of all this. And I can't re uh, wait to read your book and, and learn some more. And uh, and also, I think maybe another aspect of this is lots of us, uh, people like this, are perfectionists. And uh, uh, it's also rare, like people like me as well, are good at sports uh, at the same time as being uh, you know, polymath and, and other th other things like that, and uh, and and uh, bas basically, I'd like maybe throw that in the pot and see if you have any comment on that. And nice to meet you. Well, thanks, and, and good to meet you as well. Um, yeah, I I agree. <laughs> basically, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, it, it's very much you know my experience. Um, one of the things I, okay, this is not going to be popular, but um, you mentioned that, that Asperger's has been, uh, the term has been expunged by the APA, uh, the American Psychological Association, I think, Psychiatric Association, not sure, uh, from their latest diagnostic manual the dsm5 um first of all i would like to point out that these people are psychologists and most of the texts that they get their degrees from date back to freud and before secondly they are not medical scientists or they don't, they don't have medical doctorates. Um, they don't know anything about genetics. Um, it's very clear looking at uh, the genetic sequencing that Asperger's, ADHD, etc., are share common sequences with the autism spectrum, but they share a lot more with each other. To, to simply lump in um, Asperger's, for example, as, oh, it's part of the autism spectrum, when, you know, oh, all the evidence of medical science um, proves beyond question that it isn't, uh, you know, is nuts, quite frankly. Um, I think it's interesting to note that the, of the world's top 20 diagnostic manuals, um, Currently, only two of those 18 um, put Asperger's in with um, as part of the uh, what the APA like to describe as mild autism and what is described in Australia in their manual as high function autism. I really dislike functional label function labels. 
because so much of function, you know, how well a, a person um, survives in society, you know, is dependent on that social structure. You know, what a person may thrive in, you know, in, in one kind of society and exactly that other and exactly the same person you know in in a different society wouldn't so what i'm saying is that although i i use the function terms in the book i make it very clear that i don't like them because the whole concept of function is is a is an entirely cultural construct and in no sense a scientific one and uh, you know that should always be born in mind Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Hale and uh, Kevin. If you have a follow-up question later, we'll circle back to you. In the meantime, we have Abyss who raised his hand. So Abyss, Mike, to you. Um, thanks, Cecile. Um, yeah, so you know, I guess like um, I some questions kind of did pop up to my head while you were answering Kevin's questions, and I apologize in advance if he actually to talk about those like i said i i came in late to the conversation but um did you discuss in the book is to um sort of like uh the you know theoretical proportion between um nature and nurture which can can actually um create some kind of um autism spectrum um disorder and if so, if you actually, you did talk about genetic aspect as well, but we all know that um, even though um, genes have actually strong dominance when it comes to expressing different uh, proteins and how cells specially, I mean, specialized during embryonic stage, um, there's also epigenetic factors which can be inherited from parents that can also determine the, um, some of, um, you know, essentially how those genes will be expressed as well. So did you also investigate that? Uh, I guess I'll start with that one. Yes, I, I, I don't like um, the idea of nature versus um, nurture. As you point out, it's an epigenetic loop, isn't it? You know, one affects the other. Yeah, I mean, epigenetics is something that is, is covered thoroughly in the book. And yeah, you know, there are obviously environmental factors, um, you know, the household, you know, are there other neurodiverse siblings? Are there um, neurotypical siblings? Um, you know, the family dynamic, um, the family traditions. Yeah, all of these have, you know, have a big bearing, but the, the actual neurodiversity neurodiverse condition is inherited uh how much and to, and to what degree and and everything else um <clears throat> it it manifests and expresses and i and i use those terms quite separately uh, yeah that that does a lot depend on the you know the the, the environment um you know in which the child grows up absolutely Absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm very aware of uh, Dr. Sinclair's work, for example, on uh, on epigenetics. Um, I guess he's probably the world's leading expert, and I've read, you know, considerable amount of uh, of, of his uh, writings and, and listened to some of his um, lectures. So, yeah, absolutely, epigenetics is important, and it's an important part of the book. Yeah, um, um, I I agree. I mean, like I think we're kind of like scratching the surface when it comes to how epigenetics can alter how uh, progenies can essentially um, behave, or like sort of like knowing in advance how they're gonna be um, when they grow up. And there was also something that popped into my head when you're talking about DSM five. Now, I know that there's like a really controversial, um, like I think like there were some um, additional cases that were added into the DSM-5 uh, from DSM-4, if I'm not mistaken, and some things that were excluded. Um, I think like there is 
there's some kind of inherent nebulousness, that's a word, to, to DSM-5. Um, and you're right to be skeptical. But that also kind of remind me that if, if um, the fact that we do have a spectrum that, that is actually well acknowledged in the medical field, um, do you think that there is sort of like an overdiagnosis of, of uh, autistic behaviors, especially in children at a, at a very early age? that seem to contribute to this um, sort of like explosion of uh, autistic disorders. Um, yeah, I do. Um, and, and that is something that's discussed at length in the, in the book. You know, we, I, I'd have to read, I'd have to read you out, you know, two chapters of the book at least to, to cover that, that question. But um, yeah, uh, it is being, Overdiagnosed, it's being wrongly diagnosed, particularly in females. It's often ignored or misdiagnosed, um, and that's a subject that very few people seem to want to talk about. That that, that women definitely, women and girls definitely get the the worst treatment of of uh, of any group. And uh, yeah, I think um, I would go further as far as the DSM is concerned. I agree, it's nebulous. I, I would, I, I consider it to be thoroughly misleading, and it's it's not a diagnostic manual, you know, within my private practice um, that uh, that I use. Simple as, uh, although I do quote from it from the actually from the DSM four. And, and a bit later on from the DSM-5, uh, you know, because, you know, it is an important book and there is manual. There is a great deal there that is, you know, valuable. But, um, you know, in terms of, of what we're talking about, you know, the, the neurodiversity, um, yeah, it, it's certainly not my uh, manual of choice. And as I say, I, I do have a problem with, People making diagnoses uh, when they have no medical science background, and and you know we have to bear in mind psychology is not a science, you know, and and therefore yeah, skeptical. Yes, I am skeptical, very about it. Um, yeah, point taken. Um... Yeah, uh, I guess like I do have one more question, but since I've asked a couple of questions already, I'll yield my mic to the next person. Sure, which I believe is Kyle. Yes, Ian. Um, thank you, and, and Abyss. Uh, great question. Um, I had had me thinking about the development of the nervous system, um, and I was wondering if, um, if if you could touch on that by any chance. Well, yes. I mean, you know. You know, as you know, we have we have three major nervous systems: the, the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and the one I discussed earlier, the enteric nervous system. You know, their development, you know, again is all written from the genome. Uh, and as the the neurodiverse genome is different from, you know, uh, the NT genome. Then the answer to your question is yes. It 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 does. You know, it is. That's what I was saying earlier about um, neurodiversity being an all body condition, a whole body condition, um, as distinct from the way that it it tends to be looked at. Uh, you know, which really in in twenty twenty four is unforgivable um, as you know purely um, a neurological issue. You know, without in any way. Um, diminishing the, the neurological importance but you know we need to look a bit a bit beyond and that's one of the reasons why the subtitle of the book is you know neurodiversity and beyond and that that's one of the beyond areas explored in the book thank you very much because yeah i was thinking about the environmental as well as um like so yes um the genetic um, aspect, but like the environmental aspect, 
Um, like, is the nervous system still developing in the womb um, during uh, being a baby, uh, zero to two years old? Um, are there some environmental impacts that uh, disrupt the development of the nervous system is what I was asking. Well, yeah, I mean, the nervous system develops right up to the time you, you know, continues to develop right up to the age, you know, where people s stop growing, which is which can be anywhere between 16 and 25. So, yeah, it, it goes well beyond the, um, you know, the, the childhood stage. Uh, and there are there are numerous epigenetic factors, um, you know, some of which we've discussed. But I mean, someone growing up, you know, for example, near a chemical works, you know, with with bad, you know, with bad um, leakage or something else, you know, dangerous chemicals. I've, 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 one of the examples in the book I've given is, is you know, pesticides. People living near near farms and the winds blowing that, you know, the, those poisons, you know, into nearby homes, and um, you know, you 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 have a you know, a woman getting pregnant under those conditions, um, yeah, of course, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's going to defect, uh, uh, affect badly the, the the embryonic development and the, the the development of that child. So yeah, I mean, the the physical environment of the home, you know, is important. I mean, the nutrition of the parents, the age of the parents, you know, do they live in in good housing or poor housing? Um, you know, quality of water. I mean, there there are literally hundreds of um, of factors, and of course, there's also the the emotional um, atmosphere of the of the household. You know, I mean, I, I've said on many occasions, publicly and privately, that it's my opinion that at least seventy, and I think more like eighty five percent of everything that a psychologist would diagnose as a mental illness as distinct from a, a con, as distinct from conditions which is what we're talking about here um can be traced back to to poor environment and poverty you know the the biggest cause of the you know of of stress of psychosis of everything else is is growing up in an in an abusive um and or you know poor household that's not heated properly you know where there's a lot of tension with the, within the household you know with poor water quality um you know with mold growing on the walls you know lord knows i've seen enough of all that so yeah i mean there are a vast number of factors that that affect development and of course, those those don't stop. You know, we we know from the experience of adults, you know, particularly service people, um, you know, and, and then, then we're moving on, you know, into the the realms of PTSD, and um, you know, and and the genetic changes that 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 um, causes, and that those genetic changes, well, that's another story, and that's in the book too. Amazing, because I was actually looking at something to do um, with poverty and brain development and why I asked the question. So you you hit the nail on the head. Um, thank you. That's what the book's trying to do. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. I would just like to comment uh, based on um, yeah conditions like poverty. Um, we had a guest speaker here, I think that was about two years ago from Columbia University, and he had a study where in um, poverty um, sets back your IQ um, of about uh, uh, maybe even up to 20 points. And he had detailed uh, um, case studies of those who are who had been into uh, really conditions of poverty. And I think he also made a follow-up study on this. And I think we also had another guest from the UK who also had a similar study. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, this supports also the um, 
points of uh, Dr. Hale. On the other hand, that reminds me, this is just one uh, maybe anecdotal example about the great genius mathematician Srinivasa Ramajuan, who was, you know, born and raised in really, really uh, poor conditions. And just imagine, you know, that even up to today, mm. what those experts who had had been who had been trained a lot in mathematics are not able to solve the even the uh, problems that he had solved in his missing notebook. So, ever one setback, as maybe caused by poverty, was that of course Ramanujan died early because he was really. Uh, sickly when he was in Trinity College and in Cambridge, so he passed away early. However, this is an example of somebody who was born and raised in poverty who is really uh, highly exceptional. And also in the studies that we have in, in our advocacy for gifted children, for instance, we have identified and supported children who were born and raised in very, very adverse conditions, like, you know, uh, children, for instance, in some third world countries who are um, yeah, who are just supporting themselves on the streets, trying to sell flowers or even some food. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were in adverse conditions yet. When we tried to uh, uh, put them and also give them some kind of support and their conditions have improved, they had uh, surpassed even those other gifted children who are coming from, uh, you know, um, uh, families or homes which are, have a better economic condition. So, yeah, maybe that's talking about resilience. But in fact, of course, just imagine if their conditions were not that adverse and if they were not born and raised initially to be poor, just how much would they be able to achieve? So I would just like to mention that because that's my actual experience. So um, anyway, yeah. I th um, yeah, uh, Dr. Hale, would you like to speak or comment on that? Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean. Ramana John was, well, I mean, w one of the great geniuses of, of the, not just of the 20th century, but of, of pretty much any century we know. Um, there are exceptions, but they, they don't tend to prove the rule. Um, there's a marvelous film about him called uh, uh, The Man Who Saw Infinity. Uh, and I, I thoroughly recommend, you know, a feature film. And I, I thoroughly recommend it to everybody. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. So probably we should do another Ramanujan room here in Quantum Photonics. We had some before, but it, I think it should be more intensive and uh, uh, yeah, there should be more participation. So uh, at this point, I saw um, somebody raising his hand. Catherine Nilam, uh, did you see him, Bob? Uh, I'm trying to bring him on stage, but I could not. I'll give it a shot. Hi. Oh. Hi, I'm, thank you, I made it. I just wanted to um, add to, I think what Cecile said about the developmental um, aspects and prefer uh, refer, I think it was Kyle, to a uh, research that's being conducted at Columbia right now um, at the NEED lab. And they are looking at um, the effects of poverty and different economic factors on children um, as young as 15 months. So it's definitely being conducted and being observed in actual brains. And mm -hmm. so you can go and check that out. Just wanted to offer that resource. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's very it's very heartening to hear that this is something that's you know being being taken seriously by you know uh, one of the world's great universities. Yeah, Catherine, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, um, I think I would really like to follow up on that study. Uh, I think it's really important. And, yeah, uh, me too. Yeah. I will just recall later on uh, who is that, uh, um, who was our guest speaker at that time. Um, it's so bad that, you know, in the past we are able to curate something in writing here in 
uh, clubhouse, but now we don't have, we can't do that anymore. So maybe I'll curate it somewhere else on Twitter and also on Facebook. Yeah. And probably in the future, you know, uh, Dr. Hale, we could have just like a, a fireside discussion again on that uh, as we try to uh, look at, you know, other uh, case studies or papers on it. So thank you for sharing that, Catherine. And uh, I think uh, Kevin would like to speak. And I also saw some uh, comment from John Hassan Khan on the room chat. Yeah, so um, Kevin, uh, if you'd like to speak, I'd like to give the mic to you now. Then after that, Bob will read the comment of uh, uh, John. Oh, OK. A lot of homework to do. And like I say, I can't wait to read the book. But um, yeah, maybe a quick question is, uh, what do you think of the famous uh, genius skips a generation uh, trope? There's. I think that I think the answer to that question is that um, despite a, a wealth of of evidence, both confirming and disconfirming, that at, at this stage, the um, uh, you know the, the jury's still out on that one. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm well aware of you know of jumping genes to use the uh, to, you know to use a kind of a common term, um, and yeah, I mean, for example, my my father wasn't neurodiverse, um, and um, and neither neither, as far as I know, were his brother or sister. But my grandfather was very neurodiverse, um, and his his brother was one of his two brothers was neurodiverse, very, and the generation down from from mine. Um, my, my dad's brother's son, uh, well, children, um, all of, uh, he had five children, my, my, uh, uncle Vic, um, and in their children, or rather, you know, in, sorry, my, my uncle Jeff, um, but in, in in all of his grandchildren, in, in each of those families, there is at least one neurodiverse child. So again, that would suggest, it, you know, it, it skipped my cousin Peter, uh, my uncle Jeff's son, but from his, his children and the children of his sisters, there's there's not a single one of them that doesn't have at least one neurodiverse child, and and uh, most of them have more than one neurodiverse, well, adults now I suppose. So yeah, there's there's it's an interesting area of study from a scientific point of view. Yeah, thank, well, thank you, you, Bob. Bob. All right, uh, would you be able to read? Yes, indeed. Uh, John states that ASD is an immunological issue. Uh, maternal immune activation is often cited, and the gut is a major regulator of immune functions. Uh, do you have a comment on this, doctor? Yes, it's true. And, you know, because, because you know, uh, Neurodiversity is a, uh, as I've said before, a, an all-body condition. Um, the genome's different, and that's going to affect every aspect of of development, including the one that the the gentleman cites. So, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Thank you. Abyss was raising his hand a while ago. Abyss. Yeah, thanks, Cecile. Um, so when you're talking about uh, at least like the neurological effects of uh, autism spectrum disorder, um, I remember when Carl Desroth from Stanford was trying to prove or at least demonstrate clarity uh, when he was kind of like, you know, um, 
showing to the world that clarity is an option to do um, optical imaging on a brain tissue or any kind of tissue. They used um, uh, a cortex, I, I forgot like which part of the cortex, but essentially um, a cortical biopsy of a seven-year-old who was diagnosed with aut um, autism. And what they noticed was that there were a large amount of neurons that were actually self-synapsing. Um, so which led them to believe that um, during development from like from zero to two, where there is significant amount of synaptic pruning that uh, due to autism, that there is that process is severely hampered in a way. Um, so which led me to believe that, um, you know, like essentially, you know, uh, this, this kind of condition uh, I don't know, like if they actually went through, went with this kind of theory and did further investigation, I'll have to check for recent publications, but I'm just wondering if you actually did consider the neurobiological effects of um, autism, not just from like pure genetic point of view, but sort of like how uh, neurons are actually um, connected or, or different types of neurons uh, connected because like there is a large amount of neuron connection there but i'm just wondering if you actually did consider that as well i was also going to mention the gut microbiome studies which seem to uh, indicate that um, addition of or gut my uh, you know um, diversity in gut flora actually does uh, alleviate autistic um, behaviors as well i don't know if you looked into that, those studies um, I would love to hear what your comments are on those. Yeah, we've 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 um, earlier on. I think we've we've pretty much covered all of those those questions. Um, yeah, I mean, if you if you've got if you have an, a if you do uh, you know fMRI studies, um, you know, coupled with EEGs, uh, you know, that gives you a very good um, picture, literally of brain activity and it's very different with you know different areas light up with different stimuli uh, compared with uh, a neurotypical brain um, we've we've discussed the you know the, the relationship between uh, autism and the you know and uh, intestinal uh, flora and fauna and we've um, you know, we we've talked about the enteric nervous system, the, the the third brain, all the neurons down the, uh, you know, intestinal path. Um, as far as the yeah, I mean, when you when you actually have, uh, you know, brains on the table and you're conducting pathology, um, yes, the 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 density type connection positioning um of of the neurons from a, a neurodiverse brain you know is is very very different compared again with the with a neurotypical brain that may be in the you know on the table next to it um you know different types of neurons in different places and and the synaptic connections are are totally different uh you know they they the, the the amount of difference varies, but um, you know there are, there is always that structural difference, as there is the electrochemical difference. I mean, you know we're essentially electric beings, so um, yeah, the answer the answer would be yeah, I agree. All of these things are true. It's an immensely co it's as complex as the genome is, which is you know immensely complex. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, Abyss, do you have a follow up? Uh, no, I was going to thank Ian for, for answering my questions. Seriously, uh, did you find my answers complete enough or, or would you like me to kind of elaborate a bit? Um, yeah, I think like you kind of hinted on, you know, the fact that you actually did discuss this before. So I'm not going to uh, have you ex explain everything that you talked about? So it's uh, it's on me. The burden's on me to listen to the replay. Um, and you're right. I think a cursory look into um, 
functional MRI and EEG studies seem to be less invasive than brain biopsy, obviously, but, um, but yeah, uh, I'll definitely listen to the replay in order to get a full, um, uh, full answer, uh, because I, I, pre I presume that you actually did discuss those in detail and depth. Yeah, um, we, much we, earlier. we did. Okay. Um, and if you have any follow up questions after listening, I mean, you know, please hit me up on Facebook or Instagram. We'll do appreciate it. I, uh, yeah, I, I'm not on X personally. So, um, you know, those, those are the two you know, main ones that uh, you'll find me on. Yeah, thank you so much, Abyss, and yeah, thank you, Dr. Hale. And yeah, anyway, I think Dr. Hale will be back here soon in Clubhouse because we have another topic to which we would like to discuss on a fireside chat uh, about uh, transhumanism as well. So uh, since uh, Dr. Hale is uh, uh, an, an expert on different topics, he will be a recurring guest speaker in quantum photonics. So uh, I would like to welcome Jan, who just came on stage. Jan, welcome on stage. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Cecilia. Yeah, uh, yeah, I just heard that see, uh, you just uh, told us you have a very strong family history of uh, uh, neurodivergent uh, uh, brain uh, problems disorders and uh, well, I, uh, I, are, I don't like are... to use the term disorder or, or oh, problem yeah. um you know the, we're talking about diversity we're talking okay. about different not inferior um you know please sure okay yeah. i mean i, I i'm Sorry, really diverse uh, but i i don't consider myself to be um intellectually inferior or an inferior second rate uh, human being because of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry for my yeah uh, mistake. Yeah. So I'm just wondering because there are many genes uh, has been uh, uh, found to uh, uh, have strong association with those uh, uh, neurodivergence uh, differences. So. Have any of your family members or anybody been tested for any of those uh, uh, say genes or anything? So I saw oh, that, yes, that would be very, very interesting. I have been, I have been, and other family members have been, and and it, the results are, are consistent that that there are significant genetic differences um, through my uh, bloodline, um, you know, compared with. Uh, you know, the majority of people, you're absolutely right. Okay, yeah, that will, yeah, uh, I, I think that will contribute to, uh, uh, a lot to the uh, knowledge of our, see, uh, the human knowledge about this uh, neurodivergence. Yeah, well, it, it is, I agree, it is genetically, you know, it is basically all about the genome. Um, so yeah, the, the, the more we learn, the better. Yeah, the genes. Um, and, and as I, I, did mention, I did mention earlier that, um, you know, we know enough about neurodiversity now that we know we have a, we're beginning to form a very clear picture of, of what specific sequences, you know, coded sequences within the genome cause, um, the uh, cause each um, condition um, which neurodiverse condition yeah see for example there were uh, people had found genes uh, associated with uh, the gut bacteria those uh, and uh, some neuro uh, developmental genes uh, so they are associated with uh, uh, autism spectrum. Uh, 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 so uh, I'm just wondering, so if, if we can analyze those genes, maybe uh, it's, it will be further our, uh, understanding our, uh, 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 of those uh, diverging. Uh, yes, yes. Sorry, I can't. Yes, I have, you know, I'm a medical scientist. I, 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 I've studied that. 
And, um, you know, we, we, we um, kind of talked a bit earlier about uh, the, the gut brain, um, you know, connection and the enteric nervous system and, and how that affects the, uh, the, the, the gut flora and fauna. So, um, yeah, you know, what affects the genome affects everything. And that includes, you know, the, the, the gut, you know, from, from eye color to, you know, absolutely everything. You know, we, we are the product of our, of our genes. We are the product of our genome to a, to a very great degree. And you add the epigenetic factors that, 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 uh, you know, some of our earlier contributed contributors mentioned, and um, you know how that can methylate or demethylate the you know the genes that we have, um, you know, in as yet to be understood order. Um, you know, it's very important. You know, so it's, it's a very very big part of it. You know, by far the most important part. And of course. That applies to to other medical, you know. That applies to other medical conditions, you know, far outside of, uh, you know, of anything to do with neurodiversity. I mean, you think of Huntington's disease, for example, you know, an entirely genetic condition. You, you think of Factor X syndrome, you know, an entirely genetic condition, um, which also shares common sequences with autism. Uh, I can't remember the exact figure, but around. Of, of those who who have Factor X syndrome, I think it's I think it's about twenty seven or twenty eight percent have autism as their comorbidity, and not the other way around. Uh, the the world authority on this is is Dr. Donna Spiker. Um, so uh, you know she she is um, you know her her writing and lecturing is you know very, very well worth uh, following up. I think. Yes. So, uh, like to, uh, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Oh, yeah, I'd like to bring in uh, something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned music. Uh, so maybe throw something else into this uh, is uh, the emotional side. Uh, what do you think music and one's mood and uh, friends, family, relationships, uh, you know, emotional IQ, you know, do, do you think any of this uh, plays into this as well? Yeah, very much so. It's why people with neurodiversities, you know, often have trouble forming um, relationships, certainly healthy relationships. And, you know, there's the whole thing about not recognizing social cues uh, and uh, getting into trouble that way. Or, you know, because we tend to be very literal thinkers and understanders. So, you know, sarcasm, irony, uh, you know, many different types of humor, you know, we we can't recognize, we don't recognize people's body language very well without training. Um, you know, issues of personal space. And, you know, a, a, a large, a large number of other factors as well. I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, because society is you know, not built for us, and because we are outsiders, um, it's that which makes being neurodiverse um, a disability. Because we are, I mean, essentially, we're, we're marginalized, we're disenfranchised, and, and most often ignored um, and mistreated, you know, by mainstream society. And a lot of that is because, you know, they don't understand. And, and one of the things that annoys me greatly, and which I cover in much more detail in the book, is the uh, is that far from just asking for acceptance as neurodiverse people, as individual human beings, you know, which we're not often treated as, um, that actually, uh, you know, Cecile uh, mentioned earlier about. Uh, you know, the, some of the geniuses and, and how they have almost always been neurodiverse. You know, the fact is, 
we owe the, the conveniences and the technology of the modern world, in, including the ability to do this now, to to people who were neurodiverse. You know, one exactly, people exactly. Like, People I think of Nicola, I think you know I think of Isaac Newton I think of Nikola Tesla I think of Einstein um, I think of Ramanujan um, you know and and so on you know and uh, yeah it seems that all we get back from society is pushback rather than a a welcome for our and a and a a desire to develop and maximize our our talents and our potential and i think this is the i mean this is the point that cecile makes about gifted you know about, about giftedness you know so often it's it's either repressed or simply ignored and and goes to waste and that is so sad and for the individual you know it's it's soul destroying it really is i mean this is a conversation i've had with with mark siegmund um of uh of mensa epg so um you know who'd make also a, a very interesting guest for for clubhouse uh you know among other people who would uh so yeah absolutely you know it's society that that makes it a disability in the main Yeah, and, and when uh, sorry. Yeah. No, please continue. Yeah, I just want to support your statement saying that, you know, um not all uh, gifted individuals or individuals with high IQ uh become eminent people. In fact, uh, there are a lot who drop out of school because I, it's either the school could not cope up with them or they could not cope with the boxed attitude of the school. And so there are uh, studies and cases, a lot of cases of underachieving gifted people. And like, for instance, well, you know, Malcolm Gladwell is just an, an observer of what's uh, happening, but he had uh, quoted in uh, he had uh, um, uh, tried to mention in his book Outliers, Marilyn was Saban, and uh, also I think uh, um, Char Charles Langan, who, who have uh, uh, also very very high IQs, and yet you know Marilyn was Saban uh, uh, became just like a waitress, and in Long Island, and I think she was just doing some. Um, uh, you know, crossword puzzle um, in some uh, newspapers, you know, that's their regular job. And uh, the other guy that I mentioned uh, also, you know, just tried to live a simple life and uh, maybe he, he went, he tried to do a ranch. And yeah, there are a lot of people who, who were kicked out of schools because they are too bright. And even those people who are at the top of their class are not necessarily the brightest. They are people who are able to comply with the standard system that our educational system for the past hundred more or so years has not changed at all. Uh, so yeah, um, the, in fact, if you see a lot of cases, especially during the early stages, many of our people who had contributed a lot to our society, science and innovation, uh, for example, yeah, like Einstein, if you look at their childhood, they will say that perhaps he had dyslexia because anyway, at that time, there was not so much study about developmental uh, disorders as they call that now, or maybe developmental psychology, you would say, or these cases. So uh, they were misunderstood a lot because, yeah, um, as people who are, who cannot cope. And uh, just like what Dr. Hale had also shared during his childhood that he's uh, saving, he was said that uh, he picked, I mean, in terms of his uh, ability to perform in school at 12 years old because he was misunderstood as a child and one of the saving graces that he had was that he was also good in sports and in my case i think it was academic excellence and also an overall uh, excellence in other fields but otherwise they, the school would have kicked me because of character education 
meaning to say I don't follow the rules and I mm -hmm. look very rebellious. And, you know, because of the discrimination between males and females, it even puts me in a very bad light because I'm a female who is very rebellious. So, uh, yeah, those are case studies. And if you look at, you know, people like Marie Curie and other people who have achieved a lot in history, you will see that, uh, uh, yeah, they are not necessarily at the top of their class. And I think yesterday, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Hale, you know, Scott Aronson is one of our friends, right? I think in Facebook. And um, there was mm -hmm. an anecdote about a teacher who, re a student who became very excellent and was hated by his teacher. So he did not perform well or he was failed just because, you know, the teacher could not understand him. And Scott said, uh, I. I also try to empathize with this because there was a teacher who did not understand me and failed him in the the field of expertise where he is excelling now. And I think Jan Lekun also tried to agree on that matter and maybe most of us. So I would just like to share this um, in support of what you had been saying a while ago. Yeah, well, I mean, another great example, and, and you're 100% wrong, is Thomas Edison. I mean, he was chucked out of school at the age of, what was it, 10 or 11 because they said he was at the, the, uh, the headmaster said that he was an idiot and unteachable i just find this really hilarious and i just wanted to support everything you're saying and affirm it because i'm i was sitting here doing some homework i'm in graduate school and i dropped out of undergrad three times mostly because adhd symptoms versus academic institutions were usually <laughs> met with, okay, kid, you don't have to be here, get out. So I'm yeah. just, it just feels very serendipitous to be hearing this. And I'm just grateful that, you know, you're supporting and to hear this is happening and this is just great. So just slay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons I wrote the book and why I want it to, and why I kept the price down. Um, you know, it's because I want it read by a lot of people because, you know, we, we seldom get a chance to do something like this to, to share the, the neurodiverse experience. And, you know, for every person that reads it who didn't know before, you know, they're going to know that they're not alone, that their experiences aren't, you know, a sign of mental illness or, you know, that everything they've been told, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping it's going to be a life changer. I know it already has been for, you know, for a number of people, but you know, ultimately, however big a number it that might turn into, you know, still wouldn't be enough. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's, it's in a way, it's, it, it, well, very important, because I, I wrote chapter headings before I started the book, that, um, you know, I did want to shine a, you know, I, I wanted it to be a pharos, you know, a, a lighthouse, um, that, hey, you know, you're not alone in the universe, there are others like you around and you know because the, the, as I say there's a very lengthy bi uh, bibliography and you know there, there are people there that you can contact you know on, on reading the book you know who've got a lot to offer so it's um, you know I kind of saw it as a lifeboat as well that was that was part of the motivation to to write it Yeah, and oh, always, uh, if I can uh, put a, uh, if oh, I can yeah. put a plug, if I can put a plug in here for it, um, a, a, a number of you uh, have said that, that you're going to um, buy the book. Uh, can I ask everyone who does, please, and ask everyone that they, that you know, if they recommend it, um, please write an Amazon review. Um, it's it's very very important to get Amazon reviews in order to um, to help with the publicity. Just thought I'd mention that, uh, and everyone is appreciated, greatly appreciated. Yeah, please check the link at the top. Uh, um, it gives you information about the book and uh, also how and where to buy this. And yeah, uh, probably uh, Dr. Hill will write a part two of the book soon because yeah, there are a lot of questions, and I'm sure that he has a lot to share. So, yes, thank you. 
Yeah, and there are also other comments here on the room chat. Uh, I think um, Abyss is here and also Diego has a comment and I think Abyss again has a comment about uh, Christopher Lingan and uh, I just, uh, uh, of course, we will go back to them, but at this point I will, uh, I would like to ask you, Dr. Hale, if, uh, uh, how much more time do you have for us? Because we've been here for about two hours now. Um. How long do they, how long do you normally these normally go on for? Um, I'm you know I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about the book. Um, so you know I'm good. Yeah, it's okay if you ask us. Uh, what, how what, long... what, what is what would be the normal the normal time for one of these these um, fireside chats? I mean whatever's whatever's normal, whatever works you know in with your and our you know, and our, our guests and, you know, obviously, um, you know, Bob as well, um, you know, it, it's fine by me. How how long are you thinking that you would like to continue? Yeah, uh, usually we have this uh, uh, room, um, this uh, fireside chats and, uh, of course, the uh, interaction with the audience for about uh, maybe two hours, more or less, usually one and a half hours. But, you know, don't get us started because we had rooms which ended after, you know, uh, two days. So <laughs> without people sleeping uh, during our early days, to be honest, and uh, quantum photonics uh, moderators have to take, had to take their turns to moderate until they could not take it anymore because the audience didn't want the room to end. And considering it was just an open discussion, we had no uh, expert guest at the time. So uh, people can stay. And, you know, since the past, uh, I think, end of October up to now, we have we had lesser rooms because personally i had been very busy and clubhouse had new settings that we had to decide on how this uh, club will go on because uh, there was a clubhouse reset then so uh, and anyway uh, i was very busy since i'm the one usually inviting the guests so uh, i tried to lie low but in i think you are the 15th room only since uh, november december and this january I mean, uh, but we have less than 20 rooms for the past three months. And most of the rooms that we have, almost all, these are rooms that people never wanted to end 100%. So my long answer to you is, well, anyway, uh, maybe we should stay for a while as, as long as there are still questions here. And of course, uh, reserve uh, some of our time for the next room since you will be coming back here in quantum photonics anyway. So well, I certainly hope so, yes but on a very different topic. <laughs> well, uh, we can still, you know, go for an open uh, forum uh, to continue this uh, topic that we have because uh, there are people who are uh, who have missed this room today, actually. So uh, don't worry, we can have a part two of this, just like, you know, an open discussion. So um, okay, anyway. Well, I have a question or a, a request if we're continuing. <laughs> For yeah, sure. We will. Sure, okay. So um, I'm very curious about uh, the developmental aspects of hearing as it pertains to autism and how, um, uh, I guess, auditory triggers, auditory processing, um, meltdowns, quote unquote, uh, I hear them called that. I'm open to uh, flexible language, of course. So um, I'm told that's how most people are addressing it. So with regards to those auditory triggers, just how that, how that works, um, insights, that's what I'm wondering. So question slash comment, <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, it's, it's known that um... People with with a neurodiversity, um, all, you know, will we'll always have at least one of the five senses hyperdeveloped. The most common one is um, is auditory, and the second most common is um, light, a sensitivity to light or a a desensitivity. Uh, People with with uh, who are neurodiverse have a completely 
different range of sounds that they can hear um, compared with neurotypical people, um, which of course leads to us being told that we're making it up, that we're imagining it, that we're attention seeking, you know, and all the rest of the insults that we grow up with. Uh, I remember numerous times when I was, uh, when I was, you know, child with my parents asking them after I'd gone to bed to, to turn the TV down because it was keeping me awake. And, you know, they had it really turned down low, you know, but it was a real problem. And basically the, and the same with, with school, you know, can you like dial it down a bit? And, you know, I was told to basically no. Um, and when I was eight, well, I, I took a gap year when I finished school at 18 and, and became a, a chemist, an analytical chemist. I trained at that before I went to university. Before I started that job, I was given an auditory test, a very, um, a very thorough one because of the nature of the work, which I can't actually discuss. And it was the auditory test showed that I was my my hearing for very low notes uh, is doesn't doesn't extend very far, but that my auditory range includes being able to hear dog whistles so what is you know when a person thinks they're speaking um you know normally to me for me it, it's like they're shouting at me and when they are shouting at me that is um you know so overstimulating that yeah absolutely it can can produce a meltdown you know of a greater or lesser degree so yeah auditory is you know, is, is a big factor. And I think autism in particular, but a lot of people I've spoken to who are neurodiverse, but not autistic necessarily, uh, have spoken about, you know, having a, a very different auditory range, not not greater or lesser than than the normal, but different. And again, that's a, top, that's a topic that's explored much more in the book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would also like to mention, uh, you know, the Broskis overexcitabilities, which is, which is common to um, neurodiverse individuals. So the Broski has been talking about the neurodiverse individuals as trying to view or sense the world in a different lens or, or in a different sense than the mainstream because it could, just like what Dr. Hill said, it could refer to overexcitability in terms of sound or in terms of, you know, the like people who don't want to have labels in their clothes so they had to cut it up or you would like not like to have your socks having even a small fold because you are very sensitive to it or uh yeah over excitability in seeing things or maybe colored there there's a recent study that showed that you know people who are neurodiverse are seeing a different kind of color than uh, uh this is just one case as uh, compared to the mainstream so uh i just have one anecdote about the person who is a composer and who composed the musical when he was only seven years old and we were um eating in a buffet but the kitchen was an open kitchen wherein people are able to hear what they are cooking and he wanted to go out of of that even if you know uh, most people would not really mind that because he hears uh, um, he hears the sound uh, and it's piercing to his ear, even if other people will, will not be affected by that. So that's an example of an overexcitability. And aside from the overexcitability in the senses, just like your example of the sound, there, there is also intellectual overexcitability, Im imaginational overexcitability, sensual overexcitability, psychomotor, and uh, emotional overexcitability that happens. Uh, although uh, people who are autistic are uh, usually generalized by uh, also the mainstream who made the study that, of course, uh, they have some difficulty in trying to interpret emotions. So that's why this uh, kind of overexcitabilities also get this uh, um, people who are neurodiverse into trouble because uh, because of such they will be misunderstood by their teachers or the society where they try to work on. And uh, yeah, uh, these are... Uh, 
like uh, I have many anecdotes and case studies uh, having done support work, you know, for neurodiverse people. So I would just like to uh, raise that. And uh, uh, there haven't been, um, I think, uh, professional studies uh, having been done on this uh, because maybe we try to discuss this as a community of support as well uh, among ourselves and we could see uh, discussions from people and, uh, like Dabrowski. So I think it's a good reference to uh, try to state your case, uh, the, the starting ground of that particular case. Thanks. So <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, there are questions here. Uh, Abyss, I think, had not commented. I think he has a last question. Uh, Abyss, would you like to speak now? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Seal. Um, so my question was, <clears throat> even though there is a um, genetic proclivity to develop some kind of um, neurodiversity, um, how often does it, um, like if you have seen any kind of or studied any kind of instances where um, the neurodiversity kind of manifests later in life where the brain is fully developed? So that was my question. Um, and I believe you are on mute if you're still with us. I think earlier he had the problem about uh, his inter oh, uh, here here. Uh, you, you, you you can't hear me. We can we, hear you. You were muted a while ago. Oh, okay, right. Um, no, I mean we are neurodiverse from the from the moment of conception. Now, can other can epigenetic factors later on in life, at any point in life, um, affect our genomes to the point where we, where an individual exhibits a neurodiversity? Um, then yes. So the answer is is kind of, as I say, no to the first question and and yes to the second. And that that's a topic that's explored in great depth in the book, uh, the the genetic and epigenetic um, interchange and um, and differences. Uh, and it, and I've I've completely I mean Cecile knows this because she's read it, but I, I've completely redefined uh, the whole concept of neurodiversity uh, in, in into two completely new. Um, categories. So, um, yeah. Okay. I have a quick follow-up question for you. Hi, Kyle. Yeah. So I was thinking about brain development and I was wondering, is it a misconception that the brain stops developing at around the age of 25? Because I've, I've, um, got a lot of friends with disabilities and I've questioned, questioned this. Um, I've seen some um, intellectual growth um, in my friends in their late twenties, and um, I was just wondering, like, it, is this a misconception that we're carrying about brain development? Um, it seems like I can't help but think that there's some sort of development happening in the brain in later twenties um, in my friends because the the intellectual growth that they seem to go through in their late twenties is actually somewhat similar to what a, a normal, uh, whatever, a, a typical quote-unquote person would go through in their younger 20s. Ah, absolutely. I, I think it extends well beyond that. A, 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 a great case study to, to read is um, uh, any, any solid good biography of, uh, of Niels Bohr and how he became smarter and smarter and smarter the older he got. And we can also point to the case of, uh, oh, I can never remember his name, uh, the, the, the great mathematician, the beautiful mind was uh, a, a film biography of. Jen yeah, he Nash. made game theory. Jen Nash. Yeah, John Nash. I mean, he, he got clever as he got older. Also, so John, I, 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 I think there's the, I, 
I think there's the potential for, you know, I mean, every experience creates an, an, a new path, you know, a new synaptic connection. I don't see why, I don't see why one can't develop at any age, Carl. I, I thoroughly agree with you, 100%. Yeah, why not? You know, there's plenty of evidence of that happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I thoroughly agree with you. Yeah, I, I can't see any reason that, uh, I, don't, I don't see why brain development stops at any particular um, age. Uh, when you study the brain, it's, you know, it's an immensely powerful and incredibly flexible uh, organism. So, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think. Thank the, you, because you know, it's my understanding that my friends, after their younger twenties, um, they don't receive the help that they would um, within their younger twenties. And if their brain is still developing, um, this help might actually be very beneficial for them. And and the reason why I asked the question. So thank you. Yeah, and I and I agree a hundred percent with you. As I say, yeah, it's a it's a very good and important point, and and thank you for for raising it. I think a piece is flashing his mic also. Uh, am I right, a piece? Yeah, um, just wanted to kind of weigh into that because I think right now it's been verified that the CA1 and CA3 uh, areas of the hippocampus actually do have stem cells that um, seem to kind of be involved in spatial and temporal memory. Um, so that's kind of, kind of being verified. And also there is this theory, I don't know how salient it is, but um, theory of um, cognitive reserve, the fact that, um, you know, when most pyramidal cells around the cortex actually start to um, form less synapses, that there is um, sort of like a buffer of neurons kind of coming in and recreating those cortex, I mean, those, those um, Synapse, synaptic connections. And the reason why that was suggested was that um, some of the elderly, uh, I think like I forgot which country it was, but might have been Italy. Uh, don't quote me on this. But um, there were a bunch of nuns that were past uh, 80 and were still sharp and their mental acuity has not been tarnished because of due to age. So um, yeah, I just wanted to float those couple of things. Um, yeah. Can you see which regions? Which regions see which? I just wanted to write that down. Thank you. Abyss, uh, I think Catherine has a question for you. Oh, uh, can you can you ask again? Um, there was uh, I I didn't hear the question. Uh, sure. Excuse me. Um, it, would you mind repeating which regions uh, of the cortex those the stem cells you said C seven I think and see what. Oh, um, CA and C CA1 and CA3. Um, so those are usually involved in um, creating place cells, um, sort of like grid cells that would spatially encode memory and also kind of involved in long-term memory. Um, of course, like, you know, long-term memory is kind of like debatable because somehow the the brain actually tends to distribute long-term memory. That's why people that have their hippocampus removed due to epilepsy tend to recall their earliest childhood, but have no, um, or are unable to form new memories. And they're uh, completely, I mean, they experience everything completely new, like on minute to second basis, but yeah. Thank you. I I also would like to comment that, you know, the theory of uh, uh, trying to stop uh, uh, developing uh, more neurons and connectivities at 25 has been debunked quite some time ago because basically, you know, the way we understand neuroscience has, hasn't changed in the past 100 years. Uh, it's only until recently, like, you know, 10 years ago or 12 years ago because we have more capacity to do experiments and we have more technology to look at the brain as compared to like 100 years ago, uh, which were in, you know, every understanding that we have has been has not been changing. It it, it has been static, and there are uh, there are several studies about adult neurogenesis, which has uh, you know already proved that uh, our connectivities increase as well as uh, um, 
if we look at how the brain develops uh, during the uh, childhood time from the moment the baby is born we are like sponges and when when we reach the teenage stage we all our brains our brains are being pruned and we try to develop effective connectivities just how you use neural networks in ai and it's because uh, forgetting is also very important in order to um, have to recall a lot of things that are meaningful in the brain. And so uh, there are evidences already of neurogenesis after 25. And another thing that I would like to mention also is, of course, based upon the stimulation that we have, the brains also develop uh, not only more um, neurons and uh, uh, we develop more connectivities and very effective ones that uh, because we have uh, a lot of information. We have uh, connectivity in the internet. We have a bunch of information. And if one is you know very excited to study more about it we just become more and more intelligent even as uh, we, we we become older there are a lot of people whom i know that uh, have been improving in, even at this days and age uh, that you know they feel like uh, even if they had not taken formal um, studies in the academy they felt like they had taken three um uh, doctorates doctorate degrees even if uh, you know they are just uh, doing a self-study so um yeah um but i had read academic papers i will have to recall it maybe already three about uh, trying to prove uh, neurogenesis at a later age so i think we even have one had one guest here in quantum photonics from ucla who talked about it yeah i just also wanted to add that when invited when we invited Mikhail, Miguel Miguel Nicolaelis, he actually talked about spatial uh, mapping and the cortex of uh, people with disabilities. So that leads me to believe that there might have been some kind of um, neurogenesis correlate happening in the somatosensory cortex, so which is kind of really fascinating. Uh, yeah, just wanted to add that. Yeah, and the piece I would like to, uh, this is a little bit off, but I would just like to mention also, you know, how they how uh, they try to explain uh, brain computer interface leading to other behaviors or some sometimes some damage on one part of the brain leading to other behaviors as well. So thank you for that comment. It's uh, very stimulating and I think we should invite again Dr. Nicolelis because he has a new book recently and I haven't talked to him yet. Yeah, that would be great. Yes, so um, uh, Bob, I would like to ask if there are comments on the uh, room chat and if uh, other people in the room would like to raise their hand, come on. You know, uh, Dr. Hale is so very generous. It's also not so easy to get an appointment with him. It took me 10 years to get an appointment with him, even <laughs> if we are friends for a long time. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a very... Um... The last decade continuing, um, I, I'd be nice to have a, but there have been reasons, Cecile, and um, and hopefully one of these days, very soon, um, we'll have a private chat and I'll I'll explain the reasons why and what's been going on. Um, so some of which is, um, you know, is, is is very much connected to the fact that I am neurodiverse. Yeah, I, uh, I can't I, relate. If, if it's, um, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's come over as as indifference or anything, I can only apologise. Uh, but the last, well, certainly the last um, seven or eight years, uh, it's a long story. Yeah, one day we'd um, like to hear that. Uh, no, I, it's not something I'd want to discuss in public, but it's something I'd be more than happy to share with you and, and to explain, um, you know, that, that period of time. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, something that uh, we would be able to learn from as well. I mean, some new information from, uh, which is a personal. Oh, no, it, 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 this would be this would be entirely personal between you and I. I, I it's not something I'd want to share. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ian, Please. for your trust. So uh, we have. I mean, there, there, there is 
one of the issues, one of the things is something that I that I am happy to share, but a lot of it, um, you know, it's is is not relevant to to Clubhouse. Thank you so much, Ian. So uh, we have Anna who came on stage. So Anna, would you like to ask a question or to speak? Hi, Cecile. Hi, Ian. Hi, everybody. Uh, just Hi. wanted to, to say thank you so much for Cecile for uh, bringing this topic that we all need uh, patents, um, you know, people that are themselves neuro neurodivergent like yourselves. and. Uh, friends and I mean all this awareness like <laughs> through awareness through um, things that we definitely need to know I, I appreciate this so much Cecile and Ian thank you so much for your kindness to come and share all this knowledge in this in this room and uh, be willing to take our, our questions or the questions that I um, I I just benefited just walking in I immediately uh, benefited from this conversation so I just Truly wanted to say thank you so much for for all this um, all this information. I, I hope and I wish that you keep coming back and and I hope I can be here <laughs> exactly as, uh, on time. Yeah, um, I I hope both those things as well and and everyone else and you know more people next time that would be you know the more the more the better you know it's it's um, it is about sharing and uh, that's, yeah thank you for your comments. No, definitely. Cecile used to do the rooms uh, that this uh, club used to, or this house now, used to run. There were plenty, plenty of people benefiting from the information. It's just how Clubhouse uh, moved things around that kind of uh, throws off a clue in, in the road. But uh, we're, we're here. We're trying. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you so much for letting me, let me come up. Have a wonderful day. You too. Cheers. Yeah, thank you so much, Anna. So we hope that you will continue your support. It's because of all of you, you know, that we are inspired to continue this. And probably in the future, we will uh, simultaneously stream it in other um, other uh, platforms. And yeah, uh, we hope uh, that we can continue doing these rooms because of our advocacy for STEM and in, in making different kinds of discussions that we have here and giving a chance for all of you to be able to ask questions speak up because this is a community and we learn and love each other we learn from each other so yeah i think uh, that uh, we are going to wrap up soon i was inviting eric who's there in the audience to come on stage and just say hello because we're going to wrap up soon uh, although we really don't want to because we want to hear more from dr hale but uh, you know it's uh, well if if, uh, if people want to hear more on the subject then uh they must read the book. So, all right. So, please check out. Uh, and, uh, well, if, once people have read the book, um, you know, let's do this again. And, and uh, because that, you know, reading it will stimulate questions because that was one of the purposes of writing it to, to stimulate debate, hopefully to spread out in a ripple effect and, and change the way that we're looked at and the way that we're and the way that we're treated. Yeah, uh, Ian, I would also like to commend you for your efforts on trying to uh, consider and uh, uh, make a community also to influence legislation to uh, also, you know, um, have a better um, treatment of people who are neurodiverse mm -hmm. as well. So I would like to congratulate you and commend your leadership on this. Yeah, well, that's, that's also, you know, someone who's, you know, what probably the world's leading uh, activists um, I mentioned earlier to you, and you, and you mentioned the, the women's, women's radio show, um, Dr. Anna Kennedy OBE, uh, Anna Kennedy Online, Anna Kennedy OBE, sorry, online. Um, you know, she is an extraordinary lady, um, you know, who has been honored by the, by the late queen. And um, you know she, you know she's she's an inspiration. What can I say? Yeah. Uh, later on, I think I will post the name of your program in my Twitter and also in Facebook, so that uh, people can also 
uh, listen to it sometime. So anyway, please check out the link at the top of the screen. Uh, Dr. Haley, for those who just came in, has a book uh, here on the spectrum. So Ian Hale's Family Guide to Autism and Beyond. So uh, please check out this book and we hope we can support uh, Dr. Hale by trying to buy the book. And so uh, I think Ian, we're going to wrap up soon and uh, I, I am very yeah. much honored and very absolutely thankful for your coming here and sharing with us uh, uh, your knowledge and yourself as a person. So uh, I would like to ask if you have some last message to the audience before we end this room. Uh, yeah, just to repeat it, uh, uh, I, if every if everyone you know if you all, if you if you all buy it, um, you know please write the Amazon review because Amazon pick that up on their algorithms, and they and they they give a lot of publicity once you've got, um, you know a, a certain number of reviews. So. Uh, you know that's something that myself and my and my PR guy, um, who is incredibly gifted himself, by the way, uh, you know he's asked me to to mention that. So um, that'd be great, and, I, and I'd like to thank Cecile and Bob, and and the other people who've made this possible, and and thank you all for for turning up. I ask that you, you know, if you're kind enough to to spread the word, so to speak. Um, and you know, share the, you know, share what we've what we've done today, uh, you know, with your, um, you know, with your contacts and, and anyone you know, you know, who's affected by neurodiversity. You know, it, it's only about one in a hundred people are neurodiverse, but no one can walk through a day, a normal day, um, without meeting neurodiverse people. Or at least one or two. Um, so you know, in a way, neurodiversity affects everyone in society, um, which is you know another reason that I felt necessary to uh, speak my my mind and my experience, and you know, apply my professional uh, areas to that as well. So, yeah, and as I say, thanks for everyone who took part. And I definitely look forward to clubhouses in the future with you all. Yeah, thank you again. And uh, we'd like to thank uh, Kevin, Kyle, uh, Catherine, who are, who are on stage. And uh, yeah, earlier, those of you who came on stage to Abyss and also Sterling. And here we still have Anna, Joe, Tomoko, Jego, Zizu, Chi. Uh, Eric here, Mary, uh, Nada, and Mira. Thank you so much, everyone. So, Bob, do you have a last message before we get, turn over the mic to Darcel? I do. I wanted to say thank you, Doctor, because I'm coming away with a much better understanding, which I can apply within my own family. And I thank you for sharing in such a personal way. Appreciate that, Bob. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so uh, all good things have to come to an end, but not the absolute end, but for now, we will close the room. And so we'd like to give the mic to Darcel uh, to help us close the room. And once again, thank you, Kevin, Kyle, and Catherine. So Darcel. Thank you, Cecile, and thank you, Doctor, for a great discussion. Um, to close the room, we're going to start our countdown from lucky number seven. Is everybody ready? Ready. 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 Seven. 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 Catherine, six. Seven. Six. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, five. Five. Kevin, Keep the four. dream alive. <laughs> four. Who are you? Bob Thrice. Three it is. Cecil Dos Equis. Dos X, please. <laughs> Good doctor, your numeral uno. Call out our last number, please. One. <laughs> yeah, thank and you, Dr. Off. Ian Hale. Uh, see you soon in Clubhouse Let's and, go. of course, always. So thank you. We learned a lot from you. And please uh, don't forget to check the book of uh, Dr. Hale as here. So, yeah. Uh, 
See you in the next rooms, everyone. Great. Cheers, all. Thank you. Thank you.